God of those who mourn, today is the day when alleluias fall silent, and the story comes to a stop, and the words fade out mid-sentence, and even the stones keep quiet. And those who still find there is something to say, shout for the wrong side, crucify him. Today we know the Lord of life has finished the parable with one final sentence, it is finished. And the tragedy bows its final bow in the world and is entombed. All that remains is the fear that we may never find our voices again. And we will forget how to speak of love. Now the word has been silenced and the story has run out of endings. For this is Good Friday. And we say goodbye to our Lord Jesus. With these hands, I have raised a child. With these hands, I have guided a son. Now with these hands, I must release him into the world, to you. He was not an easy child. Jesus was my first. I was afraid. I was very young and I wasn't married. I wasn't ready. I was afraid. I had been told of his arrival. The angel Gabriel told me of a son, a son of whose kingdom there would be no end. I was afraid then, and I am afraid now. My son is in danger. I fear for his life. Though you have taken him, he is still my son. I do not understand what has happened. This is not what I'd hoped for, prayed for. A life so good, so promising so short. I remember his birth. It was a time of extraordinary wonder. Promises were made to me. I was told that my baby would be the fulfillment of God's promises to humankind. My son would be the Prince of Peace. But I didn't understand what that would mean. I didn't realize how he would have to suffer for that. At your hands, if I weep, I remember my baby, he was so beautiful, so happy. I was happy too. Our home was small and we worked hard, but we were content. With our hands, we began to build something together, Joseph and I. And then, I remember Herod. Joseph heard that King Herod was planning to have all the male babies killed so that he might destroy one special child, our child. My son. Joseph found a way. We left at night and escaped to Egypt. The trip was long and difficult. It was lonely so far from home. But we survived that time. And when we heard that Herod was dead, we returned to Nazareth, our home in Galilee. I remember his childhood. With these hands, I fed him and bathed him and comforted him. He was my special joy. As he grew, he played with the other children around Joseph's carpenter shop. And when he was too old for play, he began to work with his father, with Joseph. Until, well, I remember the time we lost him. My oldest son was missing and I was frantic. We couldn't find him anywhere. I couldn't imagine where he might be. He was never run to, one to run away. When Jesus was 12 and it was the Passover, we were away from home in the city of Jerusalem. The roads were dusty and filled with people. And even then, Jesus loved to talk to people, so we thought he was just walking and talking with friends in our group. We didn't worry. As evening fell, we realized he wasn't with our group at all. Joseph and I called and searched among the travelers. But Jesus was not among them. In fear, 
and anger and frustration. We went back to the city. We searched for three days. A lot can happen to a child in the city. When we found him, he was in the temple. You can imagine how I felt. I was furious. It was these hands. I wanted to wring his neck. And I was beside myself with relief. But Jesus calmly told us that we should have known that he would be in his father's house. I didn't understand that. I was humiliated and angry to discover that Jesus had been questioning the rabbis. Imagine, 12 years old. He had no right, merely a child. But no one seemed as upset as I was. I was confused. And now, through my fear, I think I see. Maybe Jesus was never really mine. Maybe God placed him in these hands. But for a moment, the temple visit appeared to mark the beginning of a change in Jesus. I remember, oh, I remember when Joseph died. It was a hard time. Life was difficult for my family. We had little. But Jesus took over Joseph's carpenter shop and helped keep the family fed and clothed. By his hands, we lived. I couldn't have asked for a better son. I truly could not have asked for a better son. He is kind, hardworking, loving, and he's a natural teacher. Sometimes I didn't understand what he was saying, but we did talk. We didn't always agree, but always I learned. Sometimes I was irritated at him, but always he is my firstborn. I hold these memories in my heart, and I think about them now while he suffers. Jesus grew and became more self-assured. He left the carpenter shop and began to travel, talking to people, listening to people. He seldom came home. Distance grew between us. But even now, as I watch the crowds around us, even now, as I know that he is not in friendly hands, my son, I stay close. I will not leave you as the others have done. You are so alone. I do not understand. You have hurt no one. Yet you are hurt. My eyes tell you. They tell me what your words do not. You struggle. You suffer. You grieve. With these hands, I cannot protect you. With these hands, I cannot hold you. You belong to another world. A world that is not mine. I hear you whisper, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. If only I could shield you from this pain. I cannot touch you with these hands. These mother's hands. And I weep. Since the first Sunday of Lent, we have added symbols of the last week of Jesus' life to our communion table for our Lenten journey. They have been here throughout the season. Today they are removed. God called us into the wilderness of the Lenten journey. These symbols represent the last week of Jesus' life that we were invited to travel with him. Today our journey is complete and we remove the symbols as Jesus dies on a cross. Week one symbol was a piece of grave cloth. On the last Saturday of Jesus' life, he raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. The scripture says, Lazarus came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him, let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. 
But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what he had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, what are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. He did not say this on his own, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. The grave cloth was the symbol of the times when we too don't understand God's plan and turn away from God. Our betrayal of God comes at a price. The last Sunday of Jesus' life was a celebration, a parade, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem of Jesus to celebrate the Passover. Mark 11 reminds us of the light of the world that shone on that day. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. A palm branch, a symbol of that parade and the joy it brought to the people is also a symbol of how quickly a crowd can turn. By Friday of that same week, Jesus was dead. The same voices shouting Hosanna were yelling, give us Barabbas. This palm branch also reminds us of how quickly the voices of the crowd become our voices. Jesus last Monday on earth was the day that he threw the money changers out of the temple. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. The money bag and the sheep are symbols of the sacrifices that were made to God in the temple. But they are also symbols of letting the world get to us. Corruption and the ways of the world creep into our everyday lives and we are unaware. Unless we are watchful, diligent, and following God's way, we may find ourselves being money changers thrown out of the temple. The last Tuesday of Jesus' life, he taught his disciples a lesson on faith and prayer with the use of a fig tree. When a tree would not give figs out of season, he cursed it and it withered. When the disciples asked Jesus why, he said, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only will you do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, it will be done. Whatever you ask for in prayer with faith, you will receive. One of the last lessons he gave his disciples before he died. Must have been an important lesson for them since they were about to go through trauma that could likely render them faithless. These figs become a symbol of those things that stand in the way of our faith. The last Wednesday of Jesus' life, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, poured oil on Jesus' feet. The symbol of her life poured out for him as he was getting ready to pour out his life for us. But Judas complained, saying, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? When we have ulterior motives for what we do, like Judas, who did not want the money for the poor but for himself, we don't have room to pour out our life for Jesus or anyone else. This perfume jar becomes a symbol of a life poured out for us and our need to pour out our lives for Jesus as well. Our final symbol 
is the place sitting symbolizing Jesus' invitation to the table on Monday, Thursday. There he changed the meaning of the Passover meal for his disciples forever. The elements of the meal became his body, broken for us. The wine, his blood, shed for us. When we eat this meal, we remember Christ's sacrifice for us and we are changed. The table has now been stripped of all signs of the Lenten season and stands bare, like the cross stands bare, because our Christ has died and lies waiting in a tomb. Let us pray. God of mystery and wonder, because we know the ending of the story, it's tempting for us to ignore the darkness of this day. It's tempting for us to go about our business as usual. It's tempting for us to move too quickly to the dawn of light on Easter morning. But give us courage and strength on this day to live for a while in the darkness, to set aside comfort and pleasure, to feel the darkness in which so many of your children dwell, the darkness into which your son Jesus entered. As we reflect on the frailty of Christ, remind us of the frailty of all life. As we cringe at the suffering of Christ, make us mindful of the suffering throughout this world. As we witness the death of Christ, bring us back full circle to the beginning of Lent, to the wisdom of Ash Wednesday, the awareness of our mortality and the mortality of those we love. Gracious God, deep in the human heart is an unquenchable trust that life does not end with death, with death. Like a seed which is buried in order to bring forth life, Christ goes to the tomb to usher in new life. We trust that we too will be raised to new life in this world, here and now. And, and in the mystery of what lies beyond physical death, we trust that the whole world will be born anew that your kingdom is coming as a new heaven and a new earth. On this day of darkness, it is for this kingdom that we boldly pray. Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this, this day our daily bread, bread and forgive, forgive us our debts as, as we forgive, forgive our debtors. debtors. And, and lead us not into temptation, temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God, thank you for being with us in this wondering moment when we stand poised between life and death, filled to the brim with sorrow, filled with thoughts of what has been and what lies before us. Thank you for the gift of life, Thank you for your son, Jesus, who is a gift to the world, a gift to each of our lives. Comfort us even as we are shaken by the horror of these last hours. Be our friend in this time of sorrow and sustain us in the days to come. Christ is dead. We await his resurrection. Amen. Amen. Were you there when they crucified?